Dr. Paulette Brown Hines is the publisher of Black Voice News and founder of Voice Media Ventures, a strategic media and content creation firm. She has over 30 years experience in media communications and community engagement and has served as the lead black media strategist for a number of statewide government and political campaigns. As an educator, she teaches an annual course at UC Riverside connecting students in media and the arts with the broader community. As a lifelong student of African-American literature, culture, and history, she leads Underground Railroad study tours with her brother, Hardy Brown II, and importantly for Redlands, is the founder of Mapping Black California, an ArcGIS geospatial technology community mapping and STEAM initiative with a goal of building a, quote, smart and connected African-American community in the Golden State. In 2019, she was featured in the book Women and GIS, published by Esri Press. Hardy Brown II is a graduate of Wilberforce University with a graduate degree from Claremont Lincoln University. He has over 22 years experience in social impact, community relations, fundraising, college career development, and solicitation of major gifts for multiple national and regional organizations. He serves as the board chair of the Black Voice Foundation. In 2018, he was elected to serve a second term as the trustee representing Area D of the San Bernardino County Board of Education. And now we'll turn it over to you. Good morning, my name is Dr. Paulette Brown Hines. I'm publisher of the Black Voice News and I am joined by my brother, Hardy Brown II, chairman of the board of the Black Voice Foundation and leader of our Footsteps to Freedom study tours. And we wanna thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you a little bit today about the Black Voice News, um, as well as its role in history of the Black uh, press. Um, Hardy, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for having me. I got dressed up. I got dressed up today, my first time putting on a blazer since, uh, <laughs> since the pandemic hit, so. Uh, I Why thought, I'll tell I'll tell you this about being in a pandemic. One of the coolest parts is the fact that we get to dress from the top up, <laughs> and then from the de the bottom below, we're just like full pajamas and and oh, hanging yeah. out with jeans and everything. Oh, this yeah. should be the life for the rest of for, for the rest of time. Oh yeah, I have one. Yeah, I definitely have one. My uh, my leggings. That's that's my <laughs> new my new attire for for COVID attire. Um, oh, but yeah. I just want to thank you for joining me, so we could talk a little bit about the history of the paper and the legacy that, that I believe that we, you know, we're continuing as, as publisher and as chairman of the board um, to live in that legacy that uh, for us, our parents started, um, you know, as teenagers, or for me, I was a teenager, I think you're younger than that, you know, growing up in the newspaper business, um, mom and dad, Hardy and Cheryl Brown, a lot of, a lot of you folks uh, there in the Redlands community know them, um, you know, they were really clear that the business of the newspaper, which was our family business, was a public good. And mm. for us, it was just not about making money. It was always uh, for um, the family. It was more important to make a difference than to make a dollar. And I, I just always think of that even in doing the work that I do now uh, as publisher. Um, you know, we published The Black Voice, which has been published since 1972, started by students at UCR. Uh, came into our family and we became stewards in 19, um, 1980. Um, but we've been publishing in the spirit of the Black press since then, um, giving voice to the voiceless, uh, shining um, a light on systemic inequality and, and disparities and discrimination, um, and really trying to focus on uh, solutions um, and uh, community advocacy. Um, we've done that in many ways, as you know, Hardy, um, through uh, reporting on health disparities, education. You know, you're um, a school board member, San Bernardino mm -hmm. County School Board. Dad served on the on the city school board uh, back in the in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, the eighties and nineties. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so education was always a focus. As small business owners, you know, we focused on. Um, trying to uh, report on the wealth gap and, you know, how do we help close the wealth gap? Um, and, and, and including in that, you know, you think about the stories that were added that 
um, some of the larger press outlets from the area didn't cover. You know, I think about all of the church stories and all of the things with the NAACP and um, many other things, businesses being open that other people didn't record. Uh, and so you, when you think about the story, the greater story, the community good, uh, and you read some of those some of those pieces, you'll see exactly what mom and dad were thinking as they were doing a lot of the writing. And then you, as what, uh, I think, late teens, early 20s, even doing a lot of the writing. I remember us growing up, going down to the newspaper, you doing the writing and the layout. And then me, I was rolling newspapers and throwing them every single uh, week as we were that's taking right. them out. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. like, you know, that's like a, a childhood job is, is, is throwing newspapers. I worked, um, as you said, I did typesetting. Mm -hmm. uh, my first job, my first job with the paper was when I was in um, high school and I was subscription manager. We had just gotten... Um, we just got a new computer and I'll never forget because um, Marlon Brown, who was on the school board with that, had a computer uh, store in the Redlands Mall. I can't remember the name of the store, Wow! but he sold dad this K-Pro uh, personal computer with the big yep. floppy disk. Yep. And, I, and I managed our subscriptions um, for the newspaper. That was my wow. first job. And then I did um, typesetting, I did writing, I did layout, which I loved, um, yeah. you know, worked at, I, I was a exacto knife queen. I could cut, cut and pasting <laughs> was my favorite thing uh, to do. And then now, you know, publishing, um, but did it, did I think all the, all the jobs, um, but you're right. You know, we've had that focus on uh, social justice, you know, is always a focus, civil rights yeah. and, you know, and not just, um, reporting on it, but, you know, kind of being embedded in the community. So um, when we looked at police violence and the shooting of Taisha Miller here in Riverside over, you know, 20 years ago, um, the reporting that mom and dad did was kind of relentless, you know, weekly, um, uh, but they were also embedded in the community and you heard the community voice and they were able to help help the community push for change. And, and so as that we collect some of those stories, we actually have a lot of the actual written notes in our in our archive, but even more importantly than that, we have a lot of the original pieces like that K-Pro computer you just talked about. We still have that, that we can show some of the things that you guys were able to do uh, even back then. It's interesting to see uh, that story just continue to evolve, uh, but understanding how stories were written is so powerful when you see the original handwritten notes. No, well, the, you mentioned the archive. Um, we have the the CompuGraphic type, big typesetter. That's, I, I love coming over to the office and seeing that. And then you've done such a great job of focusing on, you know, making sure that we, we, we document, we collect, we archive, we keep, it, you know, you're able to help bring in an archivist this, this uh, last summer to kind of look at our, all of our collections. And I know we'll get to, you know, what those collections look like. Um, you made sure that you worked with uh, Cal State San Bernardino to digitize um, as many of the copies as you could find. Um, I don't know. And then, you know, and, you know and then for, like you're saying, you, you had a chance to kind of look at all the papers and see what kind of reporting um, that we did over the years. Um, so I appreciate that you, you know, um, seen the value in making sure that we document and have that collection there for for future generations. And people don't realize the importance of documenting and holding on to those primary sources because a couple of years ago, I remember, um, I want to say it was less than between six months and a year after we pulled out all the newspapers, dug through all the houses and the garages and the Riverside office and our office, we actually had a fire yeah. in the business. Yeah. And had we not collected that information, that would have been destroyed for all future generations. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, that fire was devastating, and I mean, I had to leave, we were able to, you know, salvage a few things, um, thanks to, you know, Riverside uh, City Fire Department, they, they saved, a, you know, our um, server, for instance, um, but there, we did lose, we did lose so much in that fire, so, so happy that, you know, you had the foresight to, to take that collection and have it digitized. Um, you know, I think about the work we do, and I know, um, we were asked by the Smiley Library uh, team there and want to thank them for asking us to, to have this conversation today um, and to share with the, with the uh, greater uh, Smiley um, Library community, you know, 
what um, more about the black press. You know, um, we've, we've been publishing for 50 years, but we're just a part of a larger um, history of, um, of a, black, a black press. It started in 1827. The first black newspaper was um, the Freedom's Journal in New York published by uh, John Russworm and Samuel Cornish. And it was just this, you know, four page, four column. Actually, I love looking at those old newspapers, um, news, newspaper and it, and it focused on current, current events of the day. You know, you were talking about some of the things that we, you know, covered over the years. You know, they had editorials um, uh, against slavery at the time. Um, I know for sure that we have, have always had a strong editorial voice from dad to the very brief four or five years that I that I wrote, which is is it's it's a, it's a, it's a it's a job in itself is writing editorials, and then now we have Stephanie Williams, who is our executive editor, and she you know publishes opinions um, every week on a strong editorial opinions. But they had that back there, you know, in 1827, they were you know speaking against injustices, not just with slavery but with lynchings. But then they had those positive, right? Like this, the they were the the um, documenter of 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 life. So they had the vital birth, the vital 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 birth listings, deaths, marriages, um, and, and it helped to fill in a, a greater story. You know, I think when you think about the United States history as as told through newspapers, that a lot of times we see certain stories and we don't know the entire story or we skip over and we just say, oh, okay, it was this person, this person, this person. But there's so many people who make up all the work that we did and the black press was really important in telling that story and, and sharing it. And then the fact that they were able to print it on the printed newspaper mm -hmm. uh, allows us now 150 years, 200 years later to be able to look at some of those pieces, go through. And instead of like looking in our textbook where it may be a paragraph, you can actually read the deeper story and then you understand the context of how something happened. You know, when we think about like presidents and bills being made or being signed into law, we just say, okay, this person signed this into law and this is what happened. But you never see all the people who pushed the story to become what it was. Right, right. You which know, is, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, which, which is important when you think of like people like the Crisis Magazine, some of our national magazine, the Crisis Magazine from the National, um, uh, from the NAACP, and then also the Johnson publication with Ebony and Jet magazine. Hey, do, and you Essence have, magazine. do you have any of those, oh. those jets? I know you, you're the, you're the, you know, we have in our archive, um, I don't, you, you get, you, you know, tell, tell the, tell the um, audience how many we have, but we have Essence, we have mm -hmm. Jet, and we have Ebony, which were the yeah. Black National publications and you yeah. built uh, this this particular one right here is the one that covered um, let me do it this way there you go this <laughs> is the one that covered the march on washington this is the actual newspaper or the magazine and the way that they built it back then is it was set up to go inside your in pocket for for someone who is like in the city and they go to the barber shop and they carry it and it has all the news that they needed really short clips almost like what you would see on social media today uh, but then if you go to the larger magazine which was the ebony that would have a much deeper story on all of that same work well you know what you, you know we're talking about that history of the black press and black media and I, I did for, for for the purposes of this conversation just look back at the colored citizen which was a yeah. monthly newspaper in redlands and you know yeah. at, our, at our office um our mother years ago had, had decided to try to collect um, the black newspapers of the Inland Empire, historical papers of the Inland Empire. So she went to the Smiley Library and she was able to get copies of, make, make copies of the Colored Citizen, which was a monthly uh, newspaper. It only lasted a year, uh, 1905 to 1906. But when I was just kind of looking at the, um, the issues and and looking at some of the reporting, even on the issues we've talked about it over the years, you know, was a focus on the the uh, accomplishments and efforts of the black community there. Yeah. There was um, there was this this through line of like equity that was really interesting to me. Wow. It was like we don't want special consideration, we don't want special privileges, we 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 just want to be treated equally. Um, and, and it was interesting to see, to see that. And then when you're saying about um, what else is covered, like 
it was, I, I mean, I knew about Book, Booker T. Washington because we've, we've done a lot on, uh, of reporting on Booker T. Washington's historic visits to the Inland Empire, knew that he had a uh, friendship with Frank Miller, for instance, of uh, the Mission Inn um, back, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, and I knew he had um, some connection to Redlands, um, but, you know, there's an issue, there's an issue that talks about his relationship to um, Al Albert Smiley. And uh, they had a relationship, they had a close relationship, um, and it was memorialized in the paper. And, you know, I, I had to kind of go back and like wow. kind of look at that history. But, it, you know, that's the kind of stuff that is lost um, if we don't go back and look at those black papers. It's that interesting, you know, one thing we're talking about obituaries and when, um, you know, people um, uh, pass away, people, especially people who contributed so much in a community, and one thing that mom, um, when she was publisher, you know, always did was, you know, uh, those folks um, were on the front page of the newspaper, their obituaries when they passed away. And I've been thinking a lot about that uh, during COVID because we're just losing, you know, some, some of our, our giants, right? You know, when Don Griggs um, uh, passed away um, there in, in Rialto, um, we lost uh, um, Dr. Isaac there in Redlands. You know, and it for us, it's not uh, like a daily newspaper. You pay for obituaries. It's you know, it's it's to, to have that record in the newspaper. But for us, it's a matter of celebrating, you know, and 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 lifting up those lives. And you know, we when when um when I look at what we did, it was like, oh yeah, they they go on the front page. You know, when we had the broadsheet, and it was like there that that goes on the front page of the paper. Um, and it's it was telling a much bigger story of their life. It's not just they lived, they died, and here are the people they left behind. It's a much bigger story because of the impact and the imprint that they made on Earth while they were here. Yeah. And, you know, and there are still over 200 that we know of, 200 black newspapers still being published um, in both print and digital platforms. But I really like to focus on the work of the black uh, the legacy black press, you know, and, and I, um, and I, as I often speak about that work, um, um, as well, there's so much interest in the currently interest in the black press, but they've served as important, uh, civic actors. Um, and they're just like, to me, a critical sector of community media. They, they're, they're vital trusted messengers is one role. Um, as we're talking about it here, keepers of the collective memory of the community, um, they chronicle the history of a community. Um, they, you know, delivering the news, essential news and information. But I, you know, I think the, the other, the other role, key role is that when I was talking about being embedded in a community, you know, they're speaking with the community, they speak of it, and they, they also speak for it. But there's that kind of dynamic nature um, that Black press, that Black press pl plays and continues to play um, today. Yeah, no, I agree. And so whenever I'm going back and looking at um, some of the stories that we're, we're going through and reading, um, it's interesting to see, remember I was talking about the fact that we have things that are going through these through lines. And when I look at some of the artifacts, the stories that they tell, it tells a totally different story than what we automatically think when we, when we assume something. So for example, uh, in our collection, and for those who, who don't know, uh, we're also the keepers of history of the Underground Railroad and many other freedom movements. But this is the book right here from William Steele, printed in 1871. And William Steele at the Underground Railroad, what he did in here that was really interesting to me is that he, he told stories of the Underground Railroad and the players and the people who worked but he didn't do it and didn't publish it. Even though he took the notes, he didn't publish it until um, almost 10 years, a decade after the Civil War because he wanted to make sure that people were safe. But from a record standpoint, now we start to hear the stories of Henry Box Brown. We start to understand the stories of Harriet Tubman and what she actually did. We hear the quotes of the, of the freedom seekers, but also the abolitionists who work with them. And if you don't have that written word to explain what they did and tell the true story, then now you're just basically set to whatever small snippet that is set aside that somebody else wants to tell the story, but you can go through and read these pieces and it helps you to understand the true, more holistic story. Okay, you know what, you're, you're talking about the Underground Railroad, uh, an important part of what we do um, as a company, as a, as a business, as a media business, 
is these underground railroad study tours. So they started when mom was publisher and editor, she um, and journalist, you know, kind of wore all these hats and photographer, but she went on a tour um, as a journalist of underground railroad um, stop sites. And so, I, I, you know, she went from, um, I think Ohio is where they started and they went all the way up into Canada. And she came back and started writing about, this was over 20, at this point, over 25 years ago, she right. started writing about it every week, you know, and, and the picture she had taken and uh, ended up being asked by the county schools you know, where, where you are now to, um, to, to talk to teachers after um, a teacher said to one of her elementary classrooms, um, made a comment that slavery civilized Africans, it was good for slaves, right? It became a national story. CNN yep. covered it, I, rem I, you know, I remember. And that um, administrator, Peg Hill, in, um, at the San Bernardino you know, County Schools said, hey, um, Cheryl, can you come speak to our teachers? When she did that, the teacher said, hey, we want a tour. And um, can you do that? And mom was like, I don't know, I don't know how, but yes, and ended up doing these tours um one one tour a year until you yeah. took over so i uh, you know um we do it now every year thanks to you it's blown up to you know four tours a year but you want to talk a little bit about you know what like why you were inspired by by the work we're, with, we were already doing with the underground railroad tours and a little bit about the tours themselves so I attended Wilberforce University, which is the nation's first historically black college owned and operated by African-Americans. And, you know, we're a part of history. And so when I was there as a student and then as an employee, as a director, uh, you guys would always come to the campus. And I would always tell stories about Wilberforce and different things like that. Um, but I'd never gone on the tour. And so it was exciting to watch the educators come through. And a couple of times it was students and community members as well. And then when we came back here to California and we started working and, you know, I was just just helping you guys because you guys are really doing all the heavy lifting, doing all the work. Um, but I really saw um, that there was a possibility of growth. And I saw that there was a number of teachers, educators and community members um, that it was needed to be able to see this information. And so one day just decided to go. I remember you talking to me saying, come on, let's just go. And I was like, okay, I'll go. I'll finally go after we'd already kind of grown it from one to two tours uh and the time i went i was like what <laughs> our story is this great and also that there are so many people that were a part of this that i didn't know oh, okay. and it inspired me to want to do so much more um decided to go back to school get my master's degree started studying historical empathy and the impact that this work does on educators and ever since then, just been on fire to be able to tell the story. Um, but the work that you guys did over those over those number of years, even leading up to when I when I joined you, um, you talked back to some of those early teachers, some of those early educators who went on the tour. And even 15 years later, their lives were still impacted and changed. I'm sure if they're watching this now, they're like, "Oh my God, I went in you know 2000 and 2001, and I was blown away." They would be blown away to see what we've been able to develop into today. Well, you know, I, I, I've been going, like, you know, of course, COVID stopped us last year. Um, we can talk a little bit about that too, but I've been going for, you know, 20 years. And every, if you want to tell people that, they're like, well, don't you get bored, you know? And, or, and I'm like, no, first off, you're going with people who are experiencing it, it, it for the first time. So that's one element of it where you see it differently because you're seeing it through their eyes. But then also you've done just such a great job of like adding little things here and there so that it's always fresh, even for those of us who, who participate every year. You know, when you added Seneca Falls and you added Auburn and we, we added, you know, Harriet Tubman's home, Harriet Tubman's uh, resting place. Um, you know, one of my favorite is William Seward's house. Um, yeah. And I, was, and I was going to say, we should tell that story about how we drove past William Seward's house, <laughs> looking for Harry Tubman's house, had no clue his relationship with her no. and that entire community and the impact that that entire community had as an abolitionist society. Yeah. And then when we found out, we were like, what? <laughs> what? 
you're stopping. You, and you're stopping yeah. with a bus of 50 people. And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> yo, yeah, that was one of those things. I remember uh, Dr. Anderson in Rochester, you know, we end, the, we end the tour. So we started Maysville, Kentucky is the furthest yeah. south we go. We end up going through Ohio, Michigan, into Canada, and in Rochester, right? We get to Rochester, and Dr. Anderson says, oh, you went by the, did you go to the Seward House? You were in Auburn. I'm like, no, who's that? And I, I, you know, I, people know Seward's Folly, but yeah. they don't know necessarily his role in, in helping to craft the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. They don't know his role as kind of part of that team of rivals of Lincoln. You know, he was really the, really the strong abolitionist. Like he, yeah. he you know, he and his wife um, were really the abolitionists. You know, it wasn't about compromise for him. Um, so, you know, to hear his story, um, right. uh, you know, just that, it was like, I don't, I didn't learn this in school. And what's right. fascinating is to have the educators who are teaching go and, and, and say, wait, I don't, I didn't hear this story. Like, I don't, or I don't remember this, or it was. I knew it, about Alaska, but I didn't yeah. know about what, 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 yeah. what? He did what? It, it <laughs> blows their mind so, every single time. Yep. Yeah. And so. You know, when we add that, I mean, you're you're always looking for something new, even if it's just you know a ten minute you know little excursion that we take. And you're like, just look at this, or did you know this and make this connection? Or let's um, go to Sandusky, Ohio, because oh, it's right off the freeway by yeah. about twenty minutes, and if we stop there, you're gonna see something really cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I just, I love, I love the work we do there. Hey, you know. Um, Let's just talk a little bit. I know we only have a few more minutes. Let's just talk a little bit about what we're trying to do with technology because yeah. COVID stopped us when it came to the tour. Um, and so you started thinking about like, okay, we need, we need to pivot. Um, and then, I, you know, and I've been thinking about technology too with the newspaper side. So I don't know, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing um, or what your thinking is um, yeah. on technology and the tour? So, you know, we... Exactly what you just said, but when you think about artifacts and you think about things like this, right? The, 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 the 1963 issue covering the March on Washington, um, we only see that one picture of Martin Luther King, but what if you could take this particular magazine and actually make it come to life or take our newspaper and make it come to life? What we were able to do this year is I did a whole study on augmented reality, mixed reality, um, artificial intelligence, and started to learn that industry. And I was looking at STEM and history and art and how do you bring those together? And so we partnered, we have a, a new national sponsor, a new national sponsor, Imagine AR, they're out of upstate New York and Canada. Um, but what they were able to do is help us to develop um, a augmented reality app that we're gonna be working on to take all of our artifacts and the tour and bring them to life. And the best way I can explain it is, um, the way that I see it in my mind so far before I'm working in it is do you guys remember whenever um, Star Wars first came out and they had Obi-Wan Kenobi right. and he would pop up and you could see him uh, we can now do that having someone like Jerry Gore who's no longer with us explain different parts of the Underground Railroad tour or we can have the speech of Martin Luther King or other people the pages pop out of the magazine and the book and people be able to see it and all they use is their 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 iPad or their Android device or whatever it is they're going to use their phones to be able to see all these things come to life. So when you see it in, in normal state, it looks normal. But then when you use the augmented reality on top of it, it tells a much deeper story, which gives that rich background and detail of something that they would have never gotten before. I, I was so excited when you, you know, had me do, a, you know, just a quick demo because I just bought those uh, Oculus um, mm -hmm. virtual reality goggles for, 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 for my husband and uh, for Kirby and, you know, a couple hundred bucks, you know, was, you know, like it was a little investment, but when you showed me the app and you, you could use a mobile phone, like some, a device everyone has, I thought, okay, this is going to be something we can use in yeah. classrooms because yeah. right now our tour is really only for adults. And what do we hear every year? We want and we to take students. students. Yeah. And we're like, yep. no, <laughs> but this will give us an opportunity to really engage students around this material as well. I'm really yeah. excited. I'm really excited about that. You know, one of the things we're doing on the newspaper side when it comes to technology, you know, we talked about the print product and we still print. We still print mm -hmm. every week. 
we went from a broadsheet to, to a tabloid size, um, kind of a news magazine format. But technology um, has always been an important part of what we do and, and always trying to embrace it. So a few years ago, um, I met another, another, another Redlands connection, met Jack Dangerman at Esri. And we, we did, a, 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 we used their technology, their platform to tell the story of segregated beaches in California. It's called a, wow. a story map segregation by the sea. And I won't, I won't do, try to sh share the screen. People just need to go to blackvoicenews.com and there's a whole story map section. But we used it and did a map tour of these historic segregated beaches. We have archive photos where, you know, little write-ups telling the story of these beaches. Mm -hmm. Something I didn't even know existed actually until we received a grant from the Coastal Commission to, to tell the tell this history. And that's what we came up with. And then we saw the technology. And once we did that piece, I was just hooked and mm -hmm. started learning more about GIS, created my own mapping project. So we started doing a lot, started to do a lot, a lot more with data visualization. We received um, some, some grant funding to help support the work and then realized to take a step back, we needed better data to create the maps. And that uh, is when we decided to build a data hub and content sharing platform that, that Google News Initiative is funded last year. And so now we're just starting to do that work and we're hoping, you know, we have a call to action, we call it Save the Black Press. We were hoping to build a model that will include data journalism, data visualization, um, really, how do we take that kind of uh, high, fine, high quality data, make it easy, easy to access, um, make it so that it could talk to, you know, the different data sets can talk to each other, and then build all this programming around it with data journalists. I was actually on a report for America session before we jumped on to this, this, this session, because we're a report for an American newsroom. Um, and that's one of the things that we're looking like to do. Um, so we're, we're looking at not just the past, you know, like we build mm -hmm. on that legacy. That legacy is important to us. That's a part yeah. of our mission. Um, but we look into the future at how do we use technology now to better tell the story? Right. Um, and that's and that's really important is how do you tell the story? People want to hear the story of what was going on uh, and primary sources, especially when you're talking about school districts or or in the classroom, that is very key because they're teaching that from a very early age all the way throughout. And, and as we get into even, you know, the arguments that we see on the news and social media and things like that, uh, we have a lot of news that is misinformation because people don't even check the sources. So by having all of these primary sources and, and the data mapping and all that information, we can take the past and now bring it into the future. Oh, no, it's been exciting. It's been exciting to work with the team at Esri. You know, Jack has just been great with, um, with you know, his staff. And, and it's, it's, been, it's been good for us and our team to actually learn, you know, as well. And then we're, we're looking at how do we help the whole sector do this work? Um, so we're really excited about what we're doing. You know, I know our time is up. Hardy, um, I want to make sure. Already? People, it's up. I know, I know. I want to make sure they, people what, what they don't realize is that we're going to just, you know, end the call and then we're going to just keep on talking after they're, after they're done. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so funny. People I always ask questions about like what life is like, at the, what, you know, for us at the Brown family. Because people who know all the kids know that we're all right. active, civic, you know, yep. civically engaged we married folks that are civically engaged. They were like, what was life like? And I was like, uh, what you probably expected. Dinner every every night, sitting around the table, talking yeah. politics, talking education, talking history. Yeah. Um, you know, business. And, yeah, business. Oh yeah, business ingrained in all yeah. of us. Um, and I think we all do this work willingly and with a real sense of purpose. I you agree. Know, sense of purpose. So if people want to reach out to us. They can go to blackvoicenews.com. They can go to voicemediaventures.com. Uh, bvfoundation.org. Yeah. Hardy and I will have a new website, footstepstofreedom.com, um, yeah. yeah. where we do more with our, with, our, with our study tours. Really excited about that. Um, and then also, I'm hoping at the end of this recording, they have our email addresses uh, so people can reach out. Um, 
Hardy, thank you. Thank you for, for joining me in this conversation and the Smile Library community. Thank you for allowing us to speak with you a little bit today about the Black Voice News and all the work we're doing um, with Black Voice News um, properties. Thank you. Thanks.